Turich, Gaelic for Lament for the Dead, is a single movement work for clarinet and string quartet and was composed by Sir James Macmillan to commemorate the victims of the Piper Alpha disaster. In the late 1980s, uh, there was a, t a terrible disaster in the North Sea when the Piper Alpha uh, rig blew up and many men died. I think there was about 80 or 90 men lost their lives. And it was a, it was a national uh, disaster, and an international story and so on. And um, a few months after this happened, a group of the relatives of the dead men approached an artist, Sue Jane Taylor, and asked her to make a public uh, monument uh, that, that would be sited in the middle of Aberdeen. And when that was done, they then came to me and asked me if, if it was possible uh, to provide a, a musical equivalent of the monument, so a musical monument in memoriam uh, for the dead men. And um, so th this, I, I was very honoured uh, to respond to quite an unusual uh, request. It doesn't normally happen that, uh, that a request comes from a source like that with, with the intensity of uh, personal and emotional engagement, but it was imperative that I responded. I think a composer has to be careful when he responds to the issue of personal grief. Uh, there are things that one can do that is, is fitting and appropriate, and there are other things that one should avoid. Um, I think what struck me when, and, and it was a woman who wrote to me about this, and she was a widow of one of the dead men, and she described the moment when the relatives were taken on a boat out to the site of the Piper Alpha. When the boat stopped, that a sound arose from the boat that was akin to the sound of keening at a, a Scottish or Irish wake. And I don't know what that sound was like, but the description of it stuck with me. And I suppose I tried to uh, create my version of it. So the, the music does not describe the disaster itself. It describes the aftermath and the grief, the personal grief as described to me by one of the women who suffered. Although, I ha having said that, when people hear it, they sometimes hear natural phenomena. They, they, they hear the sound of waves. They hear the sound of birds. Um, some even hear the sound of helicopters. I, I don't think that was an, an intention, but perhaps subliminally and subconsciously, uh, my mind turned to the, the sight of, of this place and the emptiness in the place of the disaster, and that would be the, the empty sea uh, and the empty sky. Over the last few decades, many Scottish composers have been beguiled by the sound of Gaelic psalm singing. And this is a very strange sound indeed that only can be heard in the Western Isles and in the north of Scotland in free Presbyterian churches. It's a free Presbyterian musical tradition. Um, and if anyone has ever heard it, they'll remember the austere beauty of Gaelic psalm singing. There, is no, there are no instruments allowed in Presbyterian churches in, in these parts of Scotland, so it's just the human voice. And what happens is that a, a cantor or a presenter, a, a leader of the congregation, uh, takes the, the psalm tune and begins to sing. And he uh, ornaments the line according to his own improvisational abilities. Uh, and the, the congregation follow him um, at, at a few steps behind. Perhaps they think they're singing in unison, uh, but it doesn't work out that way. It sounds as if that they're moving in their own different ways, their own different speeds, and there's a kind of what a musician would call, a, or a composer would call a heterophony. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there are different lines emerging and going at different paces and being ornamented in different ways according to uh, the individuals involved. And the, the sound is is very mysterious 
and strange and like no other sound that I've ever heard. And, and I, I, I've been beguiled by it and, I, and the technique has always meant a lot to me. And I suppose I try my own version of it um, in this piece too. It seemed appropriate that in Turuch, uh, Gaelic psalm singing would be alluded to and brought to life um, as, as part of this lament for the dead. Many people who love music and who spend their life with uh, discursive music like classical music will speak of music being the most spiritual of the arts, whether they're religious or not, whether those music lovers are religious uh, conventionally or not. And I think it points to a truth about the nature of music, that music, especially a, a discursive music and maybe a, a music that requires a, a, a deep and long-term engagement, sometimes a lifetime engagement, not just the 25 minutes of a piece like this, um, demands something of the listener, uh, demands something of uh, the music lover uh, that takes them to a different place, that takes them beyond themselves, that is, takes them beyond um, their own bodies. Uh, and that music, um, when, when it does speak to that spiritual place in the human soul, when it gets right into the crevices of the, of the soul, as it were, um, takes music beyond the, an understanding of ourselves as simply the sum of our parts, that we are something beyond this body, uh, this physicality. And, and that points to the deep spiritual nature of music. And whether we're, one are religious or not, there is, some, there is a truth in that and there's an understanding that music takes us to a special place, that music perhaps opens a window, some of us would say, a window onto the divine.